Thank you, everyone. Th thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you to David Appleyard and his crew for organizing this extraordinary institution. And to everyone for making it through the uh, tundra weather this morning to, to get here. And I think maybe I can start by telling you about my own trip out here uh, to St. Clements. I got up this morning, uh, or was got up very early this morning by my daughter at my house at Ossington and Bloor. And I walked across the street to the Eritrean little place that makes the good coffee. It's a former, Eritrea's former Italian colony, so they, they know coffee. And had a double espresso. And then I went around the corner to the shop run by the Gujarati guy from northern India. I got some rice and spices for tonight's dinner. And then a couple shops down to the Chinese Peruvian family shop to get some fresh vegetables. And along the way, I poked my head into the new Arabic shisha bar on my street that's been set up by some Lebanese people, with people sitting and smoke water pipes. And after dropping off the groceries at home, I headed over this way, past the Salvadorian place that makes the good tacos, past the corner where our Italian butcher and the Portuguese butcher glare across the road at each other. And through the mad jumble of Koreatown, where many of my children's classmates live, before getting on the subway and, and coming here. In other words, I made my daily passage through a neighborhood that is likely one of the world's most ethnically and culturally mixed. And I observed and took part in one of the most extraordinary things about that mixture that we see in Canada, which is that nobody thinks much of it. Uh, that this, this diversity causes almost no major conflicts or clashes at the neighborhood level or, or at the national level, in fact. Uh, this, despite the fact that most of the non-Anglo Canadians around me in my neighborhood were born in another country, uh, a fifth of Canadians were born in another country now, and most of them born during my lifetime. The, the, they are immigrants who've, or their children who've come during the last 40 years or so. And there is among them, among my neighbors and I, I would say, broadly speaking, a shared sense of what I call the Canadian project, a shared sense of the core values uh, of respect for rule of law and secular institutions and basic equality of people. Uh, that not unanimously but fairly widely is shared. And the word we tend to use for this experience in Canada is multiculturalism, certainly for the last 40 years or so. And Canadians are almost unique in the world in thinking of this word almost entirely as a positive one. Almost every other Western country, the word multiculturalism has become a threat or a curse or a warning. During the last two years, we've seen German, German Chancellor Angela Merkel and uh, erstwhile French President Nicolas Sarkozy, and British Prime Minister David Cameron, all denounce multiculti as some sort of a threat or political curse. Not in Canada. Politicians don't dare touch the, the word or the topic. The most recent polls indicate that 86% of Canadians view multiculturalism as important to Canada's national identity. Now that could mean a number of things, but it, it, that number means that a majority of both liberals and conservatives, both immigrants and non-immigrants, are fine with the word and some meaning of the concept multiculturalism. And th deeply, that's, I think that's important because no matter how you define it, and there's many ways to define it, uh, our embrace of that word and concept means basically that Canadians do not, in their hearts, think that there is one or two ethnic groups that are the real Canadians and that the others are somehow un-Canadian. We may think various other things, but we don't think that, which is very unusual. Nevertheless, during the last few years, when I've come to Canada and when I've spoken to Canadians, I've started to hear a new group of people telling me that they're not happy with the concept of multiculturalism. I mean, there's always, you know, people of a certain generation who didn't like the word because it meant a bunch of them coming in or something like that. But this was new. This was, a, this was people who are uncomfortable with the word and its use and its political concept. And those people are the children of immigrants. 
um, who have grown to, you know, my age, be middle-aged, uh, and especially immigrants from religious minority backgrounds, I'd say, from Sikhs and especially Muslims and so on. And over and over, when I'm when I, talking to people in Canada, when I speak in Canada, when, when I'm you know, in the media and so on, I'm talking with young people with, with darker skin than mine, or if they're women wearing headscarves sometimes, but who speak roughly with the same accent as mine, that is, that is very integrated people who tell me that they do not feel at ease with the word multiculturalism and they feel that it has not done them well. Not everyone. I mean, a lot of people simply say it's fine, but, but when I hear people criticizing it, increasingly it's the people who we would call multicultural. Last week I was in Ottawa uh, giving some talks and uh, a Nigerian-Canadian woman wearing an Islamic hedge scarf came up, told me, she said, I think it's unfair that I have to be multicultural and you get to be whatever you want to be. And that's a sentiment I've heard a lot. Now how could people be saying this about multiculturalism when it so evidently has been a success? Why mess with a good thing? But you have to understand the distinction when we, when people like me, uh, you know, sixth generation uh, Anglo-Canadian, when we hear people criticizing multiculturalism, we think they're attacking the multi part. But increasingly, what these children of immigrants don't like is the second half of the word, the culturalism. In the past, the people who raged against multiculturalism were almost always talking about the multi. That's probably true of those 15 or 14 percent in that survey who don't like it. Most of them don't like that. Some of them may prefer an original Canada made up of people from British islands and from France, which face it was the, almost entirely the definition of the country only 40 years ago or so, with a handful of indigenous people in between. At some, I would think probably a much smaller number would like this to be mainly a white country and don't want darker skinned people in their midst. And I think there's a small but significant number of, of that group for whom the word multicultural makes them think of religious minorities uh, growing in number and you know, perhaps becoming majorities uh, that they don't like and that, they, that multicultural means minarets and things like that. That's the conventional opposition and criticism of multiculturalism. And indeed, a year and a half ago, the world saw its first self-proclaimed anti-multiculturalism terrorist, Anders Bering Breivik, who killed 77 people in Oslo, Norway, in the name of preventing his country from becoming more religiously diverse. He wrote a 1,500 page manifesto explaining his theory of this. He was against the multi, very much. But there's this new generation growing up, most of them from religious minorities, all of them well integrated and fluent, who don't like the word multiculturalism. And they're, what they're uncomfortable with is the idea of being given a culture and told to hold on to it by the government, by the people around them. And I became aware of this first, not from Canadians, but uh, because I've been living for most of the last decade in England, where I was surprised to find a good part of what you might call the ethnic left, you know, people of, on the uh, Labour Party side of the political spectrum from immigrant and usually religious minority backgrounds, were very often ardently opposed to multiculturalism. Immigrants in, immigrant groups in Europe tend to oppose multiculturalism. They write books denouncing it. There are quite a few. One of those figures last year, uh, a British scholar named Kenan Malik, uh, of, who's of Indian Muslim descent, uh, who's, whose work I greatly admire, traveled to Vancouver to deliver the Milton K. Wong lecture on multiculturalism, which unfortunately is not as well known outside uh, Vancouver. And he devoted it to explaining why children of immigrants sometimes don't like multiculturalism. And I think his words deserve a wider audience. In his speech, he identified two very different ways that we understand the word multiculturalism in places like Canada and Britain. The first is what he calls the lived experience of diversity. That's what uh, I was experiencing this morning. I think that's what people who look like me tend to think of it as it is. It's, it's, it's having a diverse group of people around you. 
different foods, different cultures, people who look different, people who uh, uh, have different religions and so on. But the second definition of multiculturalism is what he calls multiculturalism as a political process, the aim of which is to manage that diversity. That's what Canada developed starting in 1971 uh, with policies to move beyond the biculturalism of, of, uh, of British and French colonialism and, uh, and, and to have a multiplicity of cultures and to have policies that funded groups within those cultures. Now here's the thing, for people like me, the native born white Canadians, we experienced multiculturalism that first way, it's a lived experience of diversity. That's what I was doing this morning. But for the immigrants, and especially for their children, they experience this second kind, not as an experience they have around them, but as something that is done to them. It is, to quote Ken and Malik again, a set of policies, the aim of which is to manage and institutionalize diversity by putting people into ethnic and cultural boxes, defining individual needs and rights by virtue of the boxes into which people are put, and using those boxes to shape public policy. That's what Canada's policies of official multiculturalism have done. Yes, they've celebrated diversity, but they've also put people in boxes. They've created communities as political entities. And these communities are often funded and organized through a temple or a mosque and so on. Now, for, I think for the first generation, for the parents, that was fine. But it becomes uncomfortable for people who are born and raised in Canada. Imagine for a moment how I would respond, or for who a lot of you would respond, if we were subject to these po policies. If there was a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant policy with celebrations of WASP culture, organized and run by something called the WASP Council of Canada, <laughs> whose leaders were a self-selected group of people from the more conservative end of your parents' community, uh, and everything you read about yourself was written through the lens of these WASP councils and their spokespeople and so on. They came to represent you in the media and so on. And for the first generation of immigrants, those who were born in other countries, this, this system was okay. It was an instrument of inclusion. It made them feel like they were part of things in Canada, it made them feel like the government cared for them and face it, a policy that welcomes Immig immigrants is, is, is the good one. But for their children, it often makes them feel trapped. They become the Sikh or the Muslim. When, while I can define my identity and my culture, as it were, by the music I listen to or the hockey team I support or what I buy or read or eat, they feel like they have a predefined multicultural identity and it's, it often is based around their religion rather than anything else. Ken and Malik says in Britain, the promotion of multicultural policies led to the de facto treatment of individuals from minority communities, not as citizens, but simply as members of particular ethnic groups. He says, with some justification, that this in Britain led to the creation of fragmented societies, the alienation of many minority groups, and the scapegoating of immigrants. This didn't, this has not, certainly not happened in Canada at this point. We haven't had race riots, uh, and there's no sign of that happening. But I think, I think we do feel the central paradox of multiculturalism he defines, which is that diversity ends at the edges of minority communities. That is that I get to have diversity uh, because I see these diverse minority communities. For the people within them often, the diversity simply is having lots of them there. Within them, it's, it's more, it's, things are more homogenous. The worst possible outcome of this is what the great Indian economist Amartya Sen calls plural monoculturalism, a diversity of isolated islands. In other words, it looks good from the outside, but it's almost a bunch of cultures trapped in aspic or in amber. Canada is nowhere even close to there yet and may never be. But inside of that criticism, the seed of it, we can see what these new Canadians I'm talking to don't like about multiculturalism. It makes them objects of diversity, but it makes it harder for them to experience diversity in their own lives. In other words, it creates the myth of culture, the idea that we each have a fixed and predetermined 
halo called a culture that hovers above our heads and directs our tastes and activities throughout our lives. It's the thing that pushes us rather than the, the clay we're shaping. I don't have to have a culture like that. As a, as, as a sixth generation Canadian, I have a diff, I, I'm allowed to have a different culture now than I did when I was 25, and I hope I do. And <laughs> it'll probably be different by the time I'm 75. And nobody finds that remarkable, that, that, you know, that, that your, the city you live in and your, the, your age and milieu shapes your culture. My grandfather's culture, and I was close to my grandfather, is so alien from my own that if I visited it, it during his prime, it would be like a trip to Riyadh now. And in fact, I think probably the attitudes toward women and sexual minorities and so on would have been pretty similar to Riyadh today <laughs> in Hamilton in 1930 or something. Nobody pretends we have the same culture as each other. Nobody pretends there's this, there's this homogenous white Anglo-Saxon culture that has propelled us all through our lives. The new generation of integrated, fluent Canadians from immigrant backgrounds and minority religions are asking to have the same, that same experience that I, that I have. They don't want to become exactly the same as me. They'll keep their religion, maybe their foods and soccer teams and, and some ties to their parents' homeland. They embrace the core Western values of equality, rule of law, secular institutions, respect for others, and so on. But they don't want to have a prepackaged culture placed upon them, especially if it's just so that people like me can have an exciting shopping experience in the morning. <laughs> they want a plural society. They want a diverse society, but one that makes them feel forced into a multicultural pigeonhole while the rest of us get to roam freely among it. No, thank you. They don't want that. And I think that should maybe be the rallying cry uh, for Canada's next generation, not to abandon the best of what we've got, not to abandon the diversity or the plurality around us, but maybe to say, let's have more multi and less culturalism. Thank you. And with that, I think we can open the floor to questions. I think we can open the floor to questions, as you say. We can, can extend saying. to everything uh, except Global and John subscription here will prices. run around with the microphone. I'm going to ask you, please, don't ask your question until you've got the microphone. It helps everybody to know what you're saying. And also, since it's being recorded, that's, uh, that's useful to have. I couldn't help thinking, while you were speaking and talking about the boxes, whether or not you see a similarity in attitude between that growing multiculturalism attitude and what we're seeing with our Native peoples currently. This is a complicated issue because um, in order to, in order to, the thing is that when we talk about people who immigrated into Canada, uh, we can talk about, not about assimilation, I don't think anybody really wants, wants everybody to become exactly the same, but about a certain type of integration, both as the desire of people who moved into Canada. And integration means, you know, inclusion into the uh, education and economic system um, and, and a mutual understanding of, of the core values and the law and so on and everything else. I, th I would argue that the cultural stuff tends to follow from that once that that's occurred. Um, but when we talk about the, the, the indigenous peoples of Canada, um, yes, we are talking about cultures that are part of the mosaic and so on, but we're also talking about um, a a legal and contractual settlement with people who self-define as nations and so on. So we, we have to put, we, we were required by the way that our country was founded and organized to put aside some of the things that we would normally object to um, and so on. We have to talk about ethnic nations when we talk about this because that's what we contractually agreed to uh, in our treaty settlements. Whereas we'd, we'd, I think we'd often be very much not interested in the idea of ethnic nationalism and so on. I think they would prefer to call it co collective or territorial nationalism and so on. Um, we have to talk about collective rights and so on, whereas I think most of us nowadays tend to prefer within our own communities to think of individual rights and so on. So the difference, is, there's, on the other hand, it also is part of the, 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 the cultural mix of Canada and so on. So, 
Um, these aren't people who came in and are becoming part of our neighborhood. These are the people we came into and became part of their neighborhood. And, uh, and we struck a deal with them uh, in the early decades and centuries of Canadian history where they got to define themselves as nations and have a certain amount of territory and so on. It's quite unlike with any other group that's moved into Canada and so on. They didn't, they didn't come land on us, we came and landed on them. And, uh, and it's going to have, that's going to have a different shape and a different political logic than, than the traditional multiculturalism things. Uh, yet, on the other hand, if you're talking about you know, life on the streets of Toronto and so on, then yes, people from the First Nations are part of that as well. So yes, that almost defines, I mean, I kept that out of my first book, Arrival City, I kept uh, formerly indigenous peoples out of the equation there because it's not the same thing as immigration, right? It's people immigrated upon. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you. Um, in the journey you described to the subway this morning, the thing that I noticed was there wasn't any reference to a French bistro or a French cafe or something. What I wonder, my question is really um, three-pronged. Um, does multiculturalism, for those of us in, for want of a better word, English Canada, encompass the French? Do the French... Canadians have the same attitude toward multiculturalism as those of us in English Canada? And the third part is, does it really matter? Yeah, and by the French, you mean the Quebecois, um, who aren't seen as French at all by the French. Um, yes and no. Yeah, obviously, the politics of Quebec, certainly those that have won the most recent election, uh, do embrace an idea of uh, collective identity and, and something like ethnic nationalism to an extent that English Canada doesn't to the same degree. Now, this is not a universal or homogenous thing. You can spend a lot of time in Montreal uh, and, and not encounter anyone who's, who's uh, uh, among the Quebecois whose attitudes toward uh, multiculturalism are different than you'd find in Toronto, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's a great understanding of that. There are language issues, uh, but within, within sort of that sphere of French language, uh, Haitian or Vietnamese Montrealers um, are seen much the same way as, uh, as th these groups that I, that I saw in, 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 in Toronto. Are. And I would say that in terms of, uh, a, here's the interesting thing, is that among the immigrants that groups themselves, I think you get the same sensibility and so on, except that as well as this discomfort with the official multiculturalism policies and, and the view of multiculturalism, you get a discomfort with the monocultural policies uh, of Quebec and so on. You do get a lot of allophone, as they're known immigrants in Quebec, who, as well as being uncomfortable with these identity pigeonholes, are also uncomfortable that they they have to have their children educated in French and not in English, and so on. Um, so yes, I mean, did look cynically on the political level, you could say Trudeau tried to institute mul official multiculturalism policies as a, as a way to pave over biculturalism. Um, did that work? No. It it became another thing. Uh, on top of biculturalism. The, the issues of uh, Quebec versus the nine other English Canadian uh, provinces still remain a core part of the dynamics of Canada and laid on top of that is, is, the, is the issues of multiculturalism and so on. So it makes, it makes Canada on paper sound absolutely impossible and a complete mess uh, and, and of course it somehow manages to work okay for the moment. Uh, in spite of that, uh, this this cultural culturalism of putting people in boxes, of having these boxes, would this tend to create tensions between the boxes? Eventually, rising, um, having uh, uh, riots between the two of them, or what, do you think that's a possibility or not? I don't think it's a huge possibility in Canada. I, I, I mean, as soon as you say that, something's going to happen. In Britain, though, it's interesting. I mean, one of the things Ken and Malik talks about is how um, in the 80s there were race riots between white British people and, and darker-skinned British people, serious ones. Uh, they were anti-immigration riots in many senses. And then within 20 years, those had completely died out. 
And you had a wave of riots in the early 2000s between brown-skinned and black-skinned British people uh, that were sort of turf wars over uh, identity and mutual fear of each other's cultures and so on. Um, part of the problem is which boxes you're being put in. If you are, um, if you are, from, you know, a guy from northern uh, India uh, who's Muslim, for example, um, are you are you Indian? Uh, are you subcontinental? Are you are you Muslim? Are you and uh, and you'd often be surprised at which boxes people would prefer to be put in. There's a lot more affinity among immigrant groups. Uh, I talk about this in a little book I wrote called The Myth of the Muslim Tide. Uh, there's, uh, in Canada, this is measured, there's a lot more affinity between Sikhs and Hindus and Muslims who come from the same part of the Indian subcontinent than there is between people of the same religion and so on. In other words, if you're a Muslim from, uh, from, uh, from Mumbai, you feel a lot closer to and you have the same experiences economically and educationally as Sikhs and Hindus from Mumbai than, than you do with Muslims from Morocco or Turkey or, or or Indonesia or so on. Um, yet, a lot of the ways we've organized communities through policies is, is through religion. Why? Because I think when you begin these policies, you say, okay, who are the community leaders? The people who speak up the loudest off and seem the most organized and the most politically coherent are religious leaders and so on, and they come to represent uh, the wider community and so on, and, and, and you're stuck with that. There's one thing I'd like to mention. Why don't we look upon everything historically? We talk about us coming into this country with the Indians here, or the Aborigines here, and yet we have gone, and people have gone into many different countries. I mean, if you look at it historically, look at the number of people that have moved about in Asia, in Europe, in England, in Ireland, and everywhere else. And they've gone into that country, and the only way they've really become part of that country is when all of the people are educated together. And why don't we bring the Aboriginals or talk to the Aboriginals about education and educating them with us. It would help them, it would help us. I think ideally that would be the case. The problem with this particular instance is that this is not a case of two cultures who happen to have of, uh, encountered each other and who are coming up with an optimum solution, but it's a case of specific treaties that, and agreements that were signed uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, the relations with the first people, the indigenous people of Canada, is not defined by how you would ideally have uh, various ever-changing cultures mixing, but it's how, it's how you obey constitutional treaties and, and agreements reached between two self-defined nations and so on. So you do, you do not have that same experience of being able to overcome it because right now the, the main issue with, with, with native and Inuit people and so on is obeying treaties which grant them uh, separate pseudo-sovereignty. It will change, but it can only change so much because we did strike very firm deals that are recognized in the Constitution of Canada uh, and so on. So I, I bracket that out of this whole picture. It's a, because of the legal and constitutional status of, of, of those relationships, it's very different from just uh, cultures living together on the same turf. Um, thank you. Wondering about the Americans and the American model versus the Canadian model, um, and if our model is working better than theirs, or whether it's time to go their way. I don't know. I'm, I don't actually think the American model is all that different, actually. And I know there's a whole history of talking about salad bowls and molting, melting pots and and. Uh, all this sort of thing. I actually think the Americans are much more salad bowlish than the Canadians uh, in many ways. Um, the Americans are much more likely for some, to, if in the States, my, my colleague Jeff Simpson wrote a, a good book about, about this, about, uh, about 
it was about Canadians in the United States, but it had a good discussion of the differences between how cultural diversity is understood in the United States and Canada. Um, Americans are much more likely to say I'm Italian American or I'm, I'm uh, Latin American or, or that sort of thing, whereas Canadians are much more likely to say I'm Canadian. Uh, or there's this interesting habit that you get in Toronto of simply saying I'm, I'm Italian. My wife says that. My wife's, my wife's um, Italian ancestors moved to Canada in about 1921 and, uh, and her, father had, her father died a couple years ago without ever having set foot in Italy uh, and she uh, do doesn't speak any Italian but she calls herself Italian in Toronto <laughs> conversation and that's not, an that's not an unusual thing but that's different from the hyphenated thing right because uh, um, one thing I've always wanted to see is, is rates of intermarriage because I, I, actually think, I actually think that there's a whole different way of measuring this which is to look at how much intermarriage there is between cultures. Uh, and some American cities have quite high levels. Um, certainly if you spend any amount of time in New York City you realize that about half the, half the city seems to be sort of um, uh, children of Italian-Irish marriages uh, or children of, 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 of Jewish Italian marriages or, or children I mean there's there's that sort of there's a, a sort of four or five key ethnic groups who intermarry wildly in in, in New York uh, and uh, and so on and I, I do want, I think that the same thing happens in Toronto uh, but I'm not totally sure uh, and so on so I'm, I'm a little bit wary to say I think there's maybe it's because I've lived in Europe for a long time and I tend to think there's a North American understanding of these things that's different from the European understanding um, in, your, in North America, we assume that when people come from somewhere else, from a, from a you know, very different background, that they're going to settle for a little while in sort of a, a poor and troubled urban neighborhood, and, and nowadays a suburban neighborhood, uh, and, uh, and they'll probably not speak English that well, but that's fine because their kids will, and, and, uh, and, and by the time their grandchildren are of age, they'll be they'll be just slightly different looking people speaking the same version of, of the language and so on. And, and that that's the norm and that if, it, if something different happens, if people somehow fail to integrate, that's the weird exception and something must have gone terribly wrong. Whereas in Europe, the attitude is completely the opposite of that. The assumption is that, that, that everyone's going to form a, a, a troubled, violent ghetto neighborhood that's never going to become part of the culture. It's going to be a parallel society. And that if somebody's grandchildren happen to become German or, or Dutch or whatever, then that's the weird exception. I mean, they're wrong about that, but, uh, um, but that, is, that is the pop popular understanding. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I, don't actually think, I don't actually think the American, I, don't, I actually don't believe there's a, this melting pot salad bowl thing anymore. I, I, I think it, it may have been true 60 or 70 years ago when the Chicago School of Sociology popularized those metaphors, but uh, I, I don't think it is anymore. Um, I have a question. How, how can you relate multiculturalism with the current immigration reforms that are taking place? Do you think it is because of the realization of the negativity of these terms, or do you think the reforms are actually bringing the ne negativity about? Thank you. This is a funny moment for immigration policy in Canada um, because we have a government that wants to show that it's reformed them a lot, is doing some some things to make some forms of immigration tougher uh, and some easier um, and introducing some forms of immigration that I'm dubious of like uh, so-called temporary immigration. Um, at the same time though it's a government that is not interested in challenging the basic levels of immigration um, for a number of reasons. I think partly an acknowledgement that there is a problem of underpopulation in Canada and that, and that uh, uh, it's very hard to run things culturally or fiscally with, with only 30 million, 35 million people spread over such a huge geography. Uh, I think partly you can look at it cynically and say that it's a government that understands that uh, the government that lets people, that gives people their visa and lets them immigrate is the government that, that family will be loyal to for multiple generations and that the liberals owned that for many years and the conservatives would like to have that. Uh, and so on. Um, 
and uh, partly because some of the more conservative groups in Canada, like the petroleum industry, lo are lobbying very, very hard in Ottawa to have immigration levels raised much, very far above their current levels, uh, because there's huge labor shortages in Canada at the moment, uh, and so on. Anyway, for a number of reasons, the numbers have gone. And what's actually also interesting is that the cultural mix isn't being challenged very much, uh, and so on. This is one of the few countries that has a, a quite a conservative conservative government who are really not interested in these ideas of who which ethnic groups are Canadian and which aren't and so on. I mean, you, we do get our immigration minister going out to Pakistan and, and giving speeches telling people how to make it easier to immigrate and, and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, uh, and that's, that's kind of the weirdness of this moment is, is that the stuff that would have divided people along across the political spectrum a generation ago no longer does. Um, you, do, you probably do get a, a significant caucus within the current governing party in Ottawa who are very much opposed to uh, multicultural immigration, but they are kept very, very quiet. Um, they are kept out of the headlines uh, and so on, and the immigration minister goes to great lengths uh, to, to embrace these groups and even to, even to encourage the foreign minister to in, embrace foreign policy which pleases uh, some cultural groups within Canada who have a large immigration base and so on. Um, that, is a, that is a big change and so on. So aside from some strange stuff which, uh, and I'd have to say the biggest noise around uh, immigration reforms is around refugee policy which is a completely different thing from immigration policy. Um, um, I'd, I'd say that looking from 20 paces back, what's unusual in Canada is how little has, has changed with, uh, with a conservative party in immigration policy and not how much has.